Hi everybody, I am Tanmay and we'll be going over unit 2 which is an introduction to a web app. In this unit we'll be talking about what a web app is and the various terminologies and some of the jargon that is commonly used when talking about web apps. For uh, those of you who are already familiar to web apps, this uh, unit might be a little basic but for the rest of you I'd urge you to pay close attention because uh, we'll be attaching a lot of meanings to the words we commonly use like browser and DNS and domain and URL, and web address uh, and things like that into a more concrete understanding so that we have a visual in our heads of what all of these terms mean and how they all fit in together. There are two main learning objectives to this unit. The first is to get familiar with the basic terminology of web apps. And the second is to convert our basic understanding, our basic day-to-day -day understanding of web apps into a more technical understanding. What is a web app? A web app is a client-server application that runs in a web browser. Uh, we'll be understanding what this means, what a client-server application and a web browser is in more detail or in more and more detail over the course. But for now, let's take an example. Um, let's take Wikipedia as an example. It's a site that almost all of us have probably used. The way we use Wikipedia is that um, we search for a particular topic, um, maybe on Google, we find a link to a Wikipedia page, we click on the Wikipedia page um, and the content loads up, we browse the content. But apart from this, users of Wikipedia, readers just like you and me, get to edit Wikipedia pages and update content. Another example of an application that we use in our browser is Gmail or uh, maybe Hotmail. And and how this works is that there is this sort of text box in our browser where we type in text which becomes an email which goes somewhere and gets stored in a central database and gets sent to another user who's the recipient of our email and that user is able to see his email again from this central database of emails and reply to that email. So these, these, are, these are two typical applications that we use today in our web browser. And as you can sort of see, Wikipedia is more of a website, whereas Gmail is more of an app. But they are all technically the same thing, which is why during this course, when we say web apps, we'll use that to mean web applications or websites or web pages, because they're all technically the same thing. So let's look at the typical experience um, using or browsing a web app, right? So for example, we open up Firefox, we enter the Wikipedia address, Firefox loads the page and we see the Wikipedia page. If you look at this carefully, there are four main steps that we followed. We opened up something called a browser, we entered the web address, the browser fetched the data from the server, which is why you see, which is where you saw this tiny connecting icon, the blue icon, um, and then the browser displayed the web page. Right? These, these are the sort of four steps that we did. And now let's go into a little more detailed understanding of what each of these four steps are. The first thing that we did is we use something called a browser. What is a browser? A browser is a software um, which we install on our devices. Um, we install them on computers or we install them on mobile phones. And a browser helps us use web apps or websites. For some examples of browsers are Chrome and Safari and Internet Explorer and Firefox. The main function of a browser is to make requests to a server using URLs or web addresses and to render the response data. So a browser can render the response that it receives from the server and display it. So for example, uh, browsers can display textual data. For example, flipkart.com slash robots.txt would load up a text file. Browsers can also load PNG files. For example, this URL would take you to a PNG file, which is, which is just an image. Browsers can also load PDF files. So, browsers can understand a variety of data and, and they, they fetch this data by making a request to a server. A computer program, any computer program that makes a request to a server um, and fetches that response and processes it is called a client. And when these programs make requests to web servers, they are called web clients. So a browser is what is technically called a web client. 
Modern browsers, apart from rendering data, can also interpret and run code, um, code which is written by the application author. This feature of the browser has become vastly more powerful in the last 10 to 15 years, and this feature is what makes web apps today interactive and dynamic. So let's take an example of a um, site that we probably all use, Facebook. Uh, if you look at Facebook, there's a little friends icon on top. And when you click on it, there's a pop that pops down and um, shows you your friend requests. Now, the way this works is that a Facebook developer or Facebook developer wrote code in JavaScript that told the browser that when the user clicks on this icon, display this pop-up box. And this element of interactivity was only possible because the browser was able to run code that the application uh, author had written. Another example of using JavaScript in the browser to make the web page dynamic is your news feed. If you look at your Facebook news feed, it keeps refreshing itself um, periodically. And that's because the application author, um, rather the developers of Facebook, wrote code that tells the browser to poll the server and to keep requesting the server and check for updates. And if there's ever an update in the content, to fetch the updated content and uh, display that. The browser is able to give us interactivity and give us dynamic content without refreshing the web page. Uh, while we're on the same web page, which is in this case, facebook.com. And this happens because of JavaScript. So we looked, at, we looked at what a browser is. The second step in our browsing experience was entering the web address. A web address um, is a, an informal term for what is formally called the URL. URL, which stands for Uniform Resource Locator, is what helps us find something on the internet. Um, so it helps us find a server and a resource on that server. For example, in this case, we're making a request to flipkart.com um, and going to the books page, and on the books page, we're searching for books related to the topic web app, right? And the URL that links us to this resource is this. If we break down a URL into those separate portions, the first portion of the URL, which is red in color, is called the protocol. We'll get into more detail of what a protocol is in the next few lectures. Uh, but for now, the most common two protocols that you will see are HTTP and HTTPS. The second portion in blue of the URL is what is called the host name. Host names usually contain the domain name, which in this case is flipkart.com. The host name helps us identify the server to which we're making the request. The next part of the URL is the green portion, which is the path. The path is uh, an extra piece of information that the browser sends to the server to request for a more specific resource on that server. So in this case, for example, we're looking for the books page and the books content on flipkart.com. The next portion, optional, of the URL is called the query string, which is the portion that usually comes in after a question mark symbol. Right. If you look at the path, the path would be usually separated by slashes. And then at the end of all of that, you might have a portion that is that comes after a question mark. This portion is called the query string. The query string, in our case, contains web app. The query string allows the browser to make a more specific request to the server or to pass additional parameters to the server while making the request. So all in all, our URL says, using the HTTPS protocol, go to www.flipcard.com fetch the books resource and fetch those books which are relevant to web app. We look at the first part of our browsing experience, which is the browser, the second part, which was the web address or the URL. And now the browser has to make a request to the server, but it can't make a request to the server based on, um, based on just the URL because computers on a network are only identified by what is called their IP address. An IP address, think of IP address as a sort of telephone number that identifies a computer on a network. Now, each server must have a unique IP address which clients can use to connect with it over the internet um, or over any network, in fact. However, IP addresses are inconvenient for us to remember. Um, for example, if you look at the IP address of google.com, it's 216.58.197.78. That IP address points to a server that serves the google.com page. Now, it would be very cumbersome for humans to try to remember this IP 
every time they wanted to do a Google search, which is why there exists a directory, a directory called the domain name system, which has human readable words which are separated by dots that are mapped to IP addresses. So for example, google.com has the IP address 216.58.197.79. Facebook.com has the IP address 173.252.89.132. This directory is maintained globally. Programs like our browser can exchange the domain name for an IP. So our browser exchanges the domain name, say for example, flipkart.com or wikipedia.org for an IP and then makes a request to that particular IP. This process of exchanging the domain name for the registered IP address is called a DNS lookup. So now we have a browser. Our browser had a web address. Our web address could now point to an IP using the domain name system. But how does this request actually get to the server? The, re uh, the request moves from our computer or our browser to a server over the network. Uh, and if you kind of trace this path at a high level, let's say our computer makes a request to a web server, it goes through a router, our router then connects us to um, our internet service provider, which could be Airtel or BSNL or ACT, and several core routers are connected to each other via cables underneath the ocean or underground. And then again through these core routers, our connection moves into um, a server. And so our request is moving from our computer all the way um, into the server's computer, where the request is processed and response is generated and sent all the way back. So this network helps us transfer our request to our destination. And the most popular way to communicate over a network is by mentioning the IP of the other computer. So now we had a browser, we entered the URL, we converted the, we found out the IP address of the server by, by using the domain name system. We used, we understood that there was a network without which the browser could not have reached the web server. And now we must understand what a web server is. And so if, if you look at this diagram where our browser is making a request over the network, the request goes to a particular computer. And then on that computer is a piece of software. And this software is called a web server. And this software's job is to listen to requests and to respond back with data on the same connection. And this software is called a web server. Very commonly, the word server is also used to refer to the actual computer, um, which is also called, which is more technically called the host, right, on which this web server is installed. So the web server might refer to the software that is actually listening to the requests and responding, or it could also refer to the machine on which the software is installed. Let's do a brief recap of what we covered. We first looked at typical browsing experience. We then took those steps um, and examined them in detail and saw what the various technical components that came together when we used the web app. So we looked at what a browser is, what a URL is, what the DNS is, what the network is, what the web server is, and what the sort of client server architecture is at a very, very high level. 